Welcome, good morning to everyone. Um, maybe I should uh, uh, you know, start off with why we are here together, right? Why an endocrinology, uh, endocrinologist in a, in a psychiatry uh, focused uh, kind of a talk, right? So the, um, the headline says, do ADHD and depression mediate risk of obesity and diabetes or is it vice versa? And we're still trying to find that uh, you know, chicken versus the egg kind of a uh, uh, phenomena, if you will. And that's part of what we are gonna hopefully bring about, uh, generate some discussion around these two topics and maybe uh, try to uh, find that crosstalk or how, how can we collate those uh, two kind of separate uh, disparate topics into one or at least uh, you know, find the commonalities uh, in that, right? Uh, last year, uh, Roger uh, uh, sent me an email and said, uh, oh, would you like to talk at this, uh, at this uh, annual conference? Uh, um, I understand this is the fourth year, so that was the third year last year, right? And I was like, so I've, uh, I wonder uh, what I'm supposed to be looking at. Uh, it, it was an area that, uh, of course, there, I see a lot, a lot of patients uh, with, with the commonalities. But then again, uh, you know, it's not a topic that I've, uh, done a lot of research in, or um, you know, I don't have the in-depth knowledge of it. So I thought this would be a great uh, learning opportunity, and I think that's one one of the reasons, at least, uh, that Roger uh, thought that uh, we should uh, that I should be uh, here. And thanks for inviting me again. Uh, I think uh, maybe uh, I got more to learn, and that's why I'm here again. So, so let's talk about uh, what I feel comfortable with in terms of obesity, diabetes. That's where I'm going to stick to. Uh, more, uh, you know, the crosstalk and, and stuff. And then the whole, whole agenda for today, I think it brings about uh, the commonalities. And I think the last piece, the last half an hour that Roger uh, uh, is going to quite uh, astutely summarize all the different mechanisms and, uh, and uh, you know, teach all, uh, all of us uh, about this uh, commonalities of the topic uh, in, in in a way that only Roger can, that'll bring, bring the whole session together by the end. So on my talk, uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, so I've been uh, part of many uh, CMEs. I've been in the past, uh, been on some advisory boards, uh, have done some research at LMC, which has been industry funded. Uh, and then other relevant disclosure, uh, recently appointed as the vice chair of the Diabetes Canada uh, Clinical Practice Guidelines. In terms of uh, learning objectives, uh, pretty straightforward, at least from what I see it. Uh, so discuss uh, confidently mental health problems uh, that are associated with obesity as well as with diabetes. And then talk about uh, how this may impact complications in people with obesity or people with diabetes as well. And then how to identify these problems and then manage these problems. Uh, so that's gonna be the flow of this. But before we do that, uh, we have this, uh, Question, so which of the following statements about the relationship between diabetes and depression is or are true? And uh, note that more than one answer may be true. So it's uh, complicated. Uh, I, I understand uh, Roger explained uh, how to answer this. You have a keypad, just one on each table. So it's a democracy, uh, majority wins is, is gonna be how, how we rule it. So we'll see how, how people do. So the choices are, uh, which one of this is true or which one of these are true. Uh, the first one is risk of depression is increased two to three times in people with diabetes. Second one, risk of depression is decreased in people receiving insulin compared to those who are on oral diabetes agents. Uh, choice C is painful neuropathy increases the risk of uh, depression. Or choice D is psychotherapy is associated with improvements in depressive uh, symptoms in people with diabetes and depression with no change in glycemic control. Choice E is one and three, one and two is uh, correct, so A and B. Uh, choice F is that one and three are correct, so A and C is correct. And then G is none of the above is actually correct. Okay, one and three, 95%. Wow, very, very astute uh, clinicians uh, out there. Yes, that is a correct answer. The risk of depression is increased, uh, and then painful neuropathy actually increases the risk of uh, uh, depression as well. 
so any complications of diabetes uh, have been found to, as, as more and more complications uh, accrue, there's more uh, chances of depression uh, is true as well. Now choice D, uh, if, we, if we can go back, was partly true, partly not true, right? So uh, psychotherapy actually has been shown to impact uh, glycemic control as well. And then choice B, risk of depression is actually increased in people who are receiving uh, insulin. It may, may have nothing to do with insulin. It may actually be the duration of diabetes rather than the insulin that may be there uh, as, a, as, a, as a reason for that. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Good job, you guys. Let's see if you can get this one. This one may be a little easier, right? So which one of the following may be used to screen for depression in a person with diabetes? Again, more than one may or may not be correct. So A is the trim D, B is PHQ-9, C is the baseline hypo questionnaire, D is Beck depression inventory, and E is uh, one and two, or A and B, F is two and four, which is B and D, and then none of the above. 100%, wow. <laughs> I got to make uh, some more difficult questions next time. <laughs> These were too easy. All right, great job, you guys. I don't think I have anything to teach you guys, but more to learn, I think, and that's what I'll try to do over the next half an hour or so. All right, diagnosing obesity or overweight. Uh, so uh, uh, Roger mentioned this, uh, that overweight, obesity, diabetes, this is like a endemic, epidemic, uh, pandemic, whatever you want to call it, right? It's everywhere that we go, everywhere that we see. And that's, uh, uh, you know, partly due to the environments that we live in, partly due to the lifestyles, but also other factors that affect it, and we'll uh, talk about that. But uh, the, the primary question is, how do you define this epidemic? You know, is it just based on uh, the definition of a BMI, so overweight being 25 to 30, more than 30 being uh, obesity? Should it be based on more abdominal obesity, uh, getting to like more buff people, they have more muscle, they have a higher BMI, should we just be looking at the abdominal obesity because that's what may be the culprit with the cutoffs that have been suggested for different ethnicities, 94 uh, for men uh, if you're not South Asian, uh, Chinese, Japanese, South or Central American, but 90 centimeter for those who are. 80 centimeter for women, uh, so a lesser uh, waist circumference cutoff, is that the definition? Or should we be actually looking at uh, a disease entity only if there is a disease present in addition to those BMI or waist circumference cutoffs or not? Again, there's a debate about whether obesity itself uh, is a disease entity, should be called a disease, should we um, um, be able to uh, say uh, or, or diagnose somebody as having obesity as a disease or not uh, is still uh, quite up in there. Of course, uh, you know, uh, insurance agencies, uh, et cetera, and, uh, you know, Health Canada, et cetera, they don't uh, still recognize obesity as a disease entity and don't uh, cover many of the medications uh, that we have uh, to tackle this epidemic. So obesity uh, has many, many different uh, origins or etiologies, uh, and some of those are uh, kind of uh, summarized uh, in this uh, Venn diagram kind of a thing, right? Uh, so you have uh, some of the uh, non-modifiable factors, if you will, at the top, which are like genetics and brain-gut axis and other determinants uh, that you see, including some neuroendocrine uh, conditions uh, as well as gut microbiome. Then on the other hand, you have some uh, environmental factors, uh, which are, you know, we live in food abundance and the built environment that we live in and work in as well. Uh, there's the socioeconomic uh, structure that we have, the culture, bias, and discrimination that we have. And then maybe some environmental chemicals uh, play a role in all of this uh, as well. And then on the other side, we have behavioral, which is individual uh, behavior. How does that impact uh, this uh, in terms of of course, excess caloric intake. We think that is a major reason why we have this problem, but it's not the only reason um, it should be, uh, should be underlined. Eating patterns, uh, sedentary lifestyle, reduced physical activity, sleep, as well as smoking, all of this may actually impact uh, uh, how this epidemic is growing and, and uh, challenging as well. Now, that's, uh, if that was uh, not complicated enough, 
If you look at how the brain uh, is uh, impacting or controlling eating, at least to me, that's a very complicated uh, kind of picture. Uh, I'm sure for most of you who are like 100% scorers, it's probably easier uh, for you to uh, take into your brain itself. But if you look at uh, homeostatic eating, homeostatic is basically eating for survival. Then we have uh, you know, all of these uh, signals, uh, if you will, that are either reducing or increasing hunger. So POMC neurons uh, decrease hunger. Uh, ghrelin is a hunger hormone. It actually increases uh, hunger. Leptin is coming from fat cells, and it, uh, it reduces hunger as well. And then there's GLP-1 and other peptides uh, from the gut that may actually increase uh, satiety as well. In the middle, we have the hedonic eating, which is just uh, for pleasure, and uh, Roger uh, touched on this, and uh, of course, is a guru on, the, on that uh, uh, part. He touched on uh, dopamine uh, as, as controlling wanting, and uh, if we talk about eating, of course, wanting to eat or drive to eat, motivation to eat. And then the opioid or cannabinoid receptors, um, uh, that control the liking, if you will, the pleasure associated with the food, uh, et cetera. And then maybe uh, the executive function is where, you know, as clinicians, we more uh, commonly try to influence our, our uh, patients or, or people around us in terms of uh, behavioral uh, interventions, uh, uh, you know, try to motivate them in terms of, uh, you know, changing their behavior in terms of uh, controlling eating as well. So all of these uh, are, are uh, brain-related uh, kind of uh, phenomena that, that impact uh, eating altogether. And uh, some of this can be impacted by psychotherapy, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, but just like depression, major depression, um, uh, Roger said that uh, in that, uh, you know, pharmacotherapy plus a behavior therapy approach, uh, so combined approach may be the right uh, approach to take. I think uh, that's the same way for most of these uh, other uh, problems that are associated uh, as well. For example, eating and, and how the brain uh, controls uh, these eating uh, behaviors as well. So that's uh, maybe, more, as I said, you know, you are more familiar with this part. What I'm more familiar with is the type 2 diabetes and the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. So I, I feel this is my home ground, right? Uh, how does diabetes develop? Uh, pathogenesis is, is related to obesity, of course, uh, in the majority of people. The insulin resistance is what drives uh, or what is the, uh, the basis or the seed for type 2 diabetes in the majority of the people. So you see that blue line, uh, that insulin resistance increases with obesity, uh, especially central obesity, and that's what uh, leads to uh, type 2 diabetes down the road, if you will, with insulin levels uh, first trying to keep up with that insulin resistance, and then slowly uh, kind of reaching a plateau and then decreasing over time. And that's happening because of the beta cells of the pancreas are not able to keep up with the insulin resistance. Hence, uh, uh, you know, the sugars start going up, and that's when we diagnose uh, diabetes. So that's uh, uh, there in addition to the hepatic glucose uh, output uh, going up as well. So the liver actually starts spilling glucose uh, into the blood, and that's, uh, you know, that's where we say, oh, this is a chronic and a progressive disease uh, type 2 diabetes. So this uh, is kind of a simplistic diagram, if you will, of uh, what the pathogenesis of diabetes is. So in this, uh, you have uh, basically three organ systems, if you will, pancreas, of course. You have the insulin resistance, uh, which is mostly in the fat cells, uh, so the adipocytes, as well as the muscles, right? So those three organs uh, is, is what uh, is depicted in this. But actually, type 2 diabetes pathophysiology may be more complicated than that. And it's been called the ominous octet, octet uh, by Dr. Ralph DeFronzo, one of the gurus uh, from Texas in the US of type 2 diabetes. And uh, what he's uh, put together is basically eight different organs uh, that may actually be involved in type 2 diabetes. You can uh, see what those organs are. Uh, maybe I'll highlight uh, the brain being one of the organs, uh, so neurotransmitter dysfunction. and. Uh, you know, dopamine and maybe other neurotransmitters uh, may be part of that, uh, that uh, do uh, actually take part in pathophysiology of uh, type 2 diabetes uh, as well. So that's kind of some of the crosstalk uh, that we see between this obesity, diabetes, and then, you know, mood or brain and, and what is uh, there. The other part that we see clinically, and I'm uh, 
principally a clinician, is, uh, is kind of uh, what patients feel or perceive when they get diagnosed uh, with uh, type 2 diabetes. So in this, uh, what I'm showing you is, uh, this is a kind of a fictional uh, you know, uh, diagram of what happens in a patient's life when they get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and in terms of their A1C. You can see if you look at that red uh, kind, of an, uh, kind of the graph, uh, the line that you have, that's what happens with an A1C. They, they get diagnosed on an average around 8.5% and then slightly coming down, but then increasing over time until about 10 to 11 years. This is the early diabetes uh, where they don't have any symptoms. Of course, diabetes is a silent disease. Uh, it's often called the silent killer, which is, uh, again, you know, people perceive it differently and they're like, oh, silent killer, that, that's not a, that's maybe a movie title. And then long-standing poor glycemia, and then all of a sudden the complications start happening, and then uh, you know we start being very serious, getting more serious about diabetes, and that's when we start saying, oh, you need insulin now, and you need this, you need, you know, why are you not uh, losing weight now? You should be doing all of this. So that's when the late interventions uh, start happening, and we get down the, that glucose, or try to get it down to the closer to the seven or the 6.5 range. What is lost is, of course, those early 10 years, uh, which uh, has often been called, uh, you know, it's been called uh, the driver for the risk of complications. It's also not just the risk of complications, it's also uh, been called this bad glycemic legacy that it's built. So people feel that their sugars are normal at eight or nine, not at five or six. Uh, they have this kind of an addiction, and it's again related to some of the neurotransmitters uh, probably, is they get, uh, you know, they get set at that eight or nine or 10 level, and then all of a sudden when you're coming down to five or six, uh, you know, people, People don't, don't like that. It's not uh, something that they enjoy uh, coming down after 10 years. The other thing that it brings up is a bad psychological legacy as well. That is uh, basically not just a neurotransmitter, but also, oh, so I was at eight, eight and a half, and I thought I was doing okay, and my doctor said that's okay, that was okay as well. And all of a sudden, 10 years later, you're telling me all that I've done over the past 10 years is wrong, and I need to, uh, I need it to be that, and I, I can't go back, but now I need to be that. So it's a psychological legacy or the problem that occurs uh, with that early diabetes as well. And again, this is what uh, uh, patients with diabetes feel all the time when we see them and we actually delve into or, or uh, take a deeper dive into, into, their, uh, into their thoughts uh, as such as well. What, are the, what do the healthcare providers think on the other hand? So if we talk about healthcare providers and uh, is it uh, healthcare providers who are at fault or is it the, is it the patient? Uh, what do the healthcare providers think? Of course, it's a patient's fault, right? They say, oh, I, I tell them this, 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 but they don't want to do this, this, this because they don't care for themselves is uh, you know, what, what they say. So, I mean, it's, it's up to the patient, they should be doing it, but they're not doing it, and of course it's their fault, that's what we think uh, as such as well. But think of it, uh, you know, I think we need to change uh, how we perceive or how we explain or how we encourage or how we communicate all of this uh, to our uh, patients uh, as such. And one of the things uh, that we need to adopt uh, are three uh, operating principles. Uh, I think uh, there'll be, uh, uh, you know, maybe, uh, be new, maybe not be new. I think to this audience, um, probably more astute, um, you know, you talk to your patients, but you also listen to your patients as well, right? Uh, so maybe, um, you know, some of you, many of you, I'm sure, are already adopting these, but uh, I can tell you that uh, majority of people who are treating diabetes, so majority of physicians, healthcare providers, endocrinologists included, who are treating diabetes are not necessarily adopting these three principles. Uh, living with diabetes can be tough, and we know that, right? It's a, it's a progressive disease, so, so you have to balance your uh, hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. So it's like this, uh, you know, um, uh, walking on a tightrope, or, or as the picture is stating, uh, you know, you can fall at any time. But it's not just that that is difficult. Uh, the reason that we think it's difficult may actually be wrong, and may actually be that, uh, you know, the patients, how they perceive this problem 
and how hopeless they feel with this problem may be actually the culprit. And that's where uh, you know, the cognitive behavior therapy or maybe motivational interviewing should be part of treatment uh, like a team approach rather than just saying, oh, so you have this disease, you take this drug and you do this diet and you do this exercise, right? So that should be uh, encompassing in, in addition to some uh, motivational interviewing and, and encouragement uh, as well. Of course, no one is unmotivated to live a long and healthy life, and that should be the understatement, or that should be the statement that we should keep in mind when we think, oh, it's your fault, and you're not doing this because you don't want to live healthy or longer. Nobody wants to do that, of course. Uh, everybody wants to live longer and healthy. It's just uh, the sense of hopelessness uh, that they feel that that is uh, at the bottom of this, right? So again, uh, you know, what, I've, what I've tried to do uh, is pathophysiology of these disorders. Uh, so first of all, I talked about obesity and then diabetes and how maybe the pathophysiology is linked to the brain. And then when people do get diagnosed, either it's obesity or either it's uh, type 2 diabetes, how their mental perception and how their thoughts actually link uh, to this uh, uh, kind of the, the brain and the cognition and uh, the obesity and the inflammation and all of these uh, pathways as well. So maybe we should uh, uh, you know, think about how patients are perceiving when we tell them that you have a chronic disease. Uh, what does that mean? Does that mean that they see the grave uh, when, uh, when we talk about the permanent disease or what are they thinking? Try to get to the bottom of that as well. Patients often perceive no benefits initially. As I said, it's a silent disease and people think, oh, so why am I doing this? Uh, I've, been talk I've been taking these medications and should I feel better or should I not feel better? I don't have any symptoms, uh, why should I bother? And bringing logbook, for example, or taking medications, I just get yelled at from my physician anyway. So why am I doing this, right? Uh, why am I taking all these medications? All I'm getting is, so, so healthcare provider saying, you're not doing this, you're, you gain one kilogram of weight. You know, we give them medications sometimes, uh, just to sidetrack, so sulfonylureas or insulin, and we say, oh, by the way, we want you to lose weight at the same time as well. So it's kind of like, oh, we are saying one thing and doing one thing that, that is, uh, that's not right. And the patients don't, don't often uh, understand, understand uh, that uh, some of these medications may actually be causing weight gain. Or the type 2 diabetes uh, itself, you know, pathophysiology dictates that, that people with type 2 diabetes also uh, are at more risk of uh, gaining weight as well. And then the last part, the bottom part, which is in gray, is uh, what's the difference? The disease is going to get me no matter what I do. I think that hopelessness is there, um, you know, whether it comes out or not in that interview with you, uh, with us, uh, is, you know, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, many times it doesn't. Uh, but I think that hopelessness is very, very common in people with type 2 diabetes. For example, uh, this slide was put together by Bill Polonsky, who's done a lot of uh, uh, research into diabetes and, uh, and psychology. And uh, when you ask a statement, uh, I will end up with serious long-term complications no matter what I do. If you ask a patient whether it's type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, almost three-fourths of the patients think that is true. So that's the sense of hopelessness that they have, a majority of the patients have when they have this uh, condition, uh, type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And so that's, uh, you know, something that, that we should be, you know, addressing and should be looking at, at least trying to uh, get, uh, get some thoughts uh, out from the patient every time we see the patient. And this emotional diabetes distress, uh, we know it's not just affecting their quality of life, but it's also impacting the complications uh, that they get down the road. Of course, uh, emotional distress has been uh, you know, associated with poor self-management skills, uh, poor blood glucose control, more hospitalizations, that means more money for the government or more money lost for the government, I should say. Three times higher risk of uh, coronary artery disease or other complications, as well as mortality as well. So it's very important to recognize uh, this kind of underlying diabetes distress, which may be there in 50 to 75% of people uh, with diabetes and probably more so if we uh, take a deeper dive into this uh, as well. So that's about diabetes distress and how this uh, correlates. How about depression itself? So depression, of course, uh, you know, has a, uh, you know, has a diagnosis uh, which is separate from just uh, distress. 
Uh, and, and if you look at, uh, you know, this, uh, this is a UK-based primary care uh, uh, comorbidity index, if you will, uh, took into effect uh, like uh, 1.7 million uh, EMR charts. And it's complicated. What I'm, going to, what I'm trying to highlight here is uh, the row with diabetes and the comorbidities or complications that are associated with that. So 23% of people with diabetes may have coronary heart disease, the first uh, column, if you will. But if you look at the depression column and diabetes, it's 18% of diagnosed uh, uh, depression in people with diabetes. And this is just based on EMRs, right? Sometimes that may not be, or that may be underreporting as well, if you will, from that EMR chart, if, as you can imagine. And then if you look at, uh, so that's what endocrinologists are seeing, or that's what uh, primary care is seeing when they see people with di diabetes uh, in the UK. In depression, people with depression, uh, major depressive disorder, uh, at least according to this, uh, it's at least 10%, it's probably more than that, but uh, at least 10% uh, have captured uh, diabetes in, uh, in there as a, as a comorbidity or complication as well. There's more, uh, so how prevalent is diabetes? Uh, how prevalent is depression in people with diabetes? Uh, so there's two things that are looked at, diagnostic interview. Uh, so this is kind of uh, like the interview uh, by a healthcare provider, let's say, and self-reported scale. If you look at the self-reported scale, of course that is higher, and people with uh, diabetes, about 30, 35% actually may feel that they have depression or some sort of a mood disorder. So it's one third of the people with diabetes that we are um, you know, seeing that have or, or perceive themselves as being depressed. And this is of course higher than the green, which is the no diabetes uh, group as such. So then uh, what is leading to that? Uh, how do we, uh, you know, we say there's some neurotransmitters, but how does diabetes impact uh, depression or, or vice versa? And what is the crosstalk uh, among these, right? So there's, of course, uh, some physiological effects of depression on glucose uh, metabolism. And this is, of course, uh, related to some of the things that we've been talking about, so inflammation, but also counter-regulatory hormones, right? So when, uh, you know, this is a pictorial of the same thing. So if you start from the right side of the, of the screen, you say, you know, somebody has stress, that leads to brain and HPA axis, as well as counter-regulatory hormones uh, that kind of get activated, and through liver and other means, uh, adipocytes included, uh, what that leads to is more inflammation. It leads to cytokines, IL-6, TNF-alpha, as well as other uh, macrophage uh, immune system uh, uh, reactants as well. And then it's a vicious cycle, right? All of these then lead to more depression, which leads to more obesity, which leads to more uh, diabetes. So all of this is kind of interlinked and intertwined, if you will, in terms of pathophysiology of how this is uh, linked uh, as such as well. Now one of the questions uh, that I asked, the poll question, uh, this is uh, kind of the answer to that as well, the bottom two especially, so longer duration of diabetes, as well as presence of long-term complications of diabetes means that people have a higher risk of depression, which should be intuitive as such as well, right? I said neuropathy, one of the complications, as uh, people with that have a higher risk of uh, depression. But of course, uh, other uh, social demographic risk factors are there. Uh, these are quite similar to people with uh, depression in general, uh, the top uh, five or six uh, that you have, which are younger age, female sex, uh, as well as uh, poor social support or being unmarried or less education, et cetera, right? So those are some of the socioeconomic uh, factors that link uh, to this. Now, there is a, there's a crosstalk, uh, we've talked about this, but also uh, we should realize that depression actually predicts bad outcomes in people with diabetes uh, as such. So mental illness and diabetes, it leads to more non-adherence to medications and self-care behaviors, which may actually be more important than actually the, the medications itself and may be interlinked. And then functional implications, uh, impairments, uh, risk of complications, as well as the costs uh, go up as well as the risk of mortality. So all of these problems are there more in people who have the comorbid depression with diabetes. And we are saying maybe what one third of those people may have this comorbidity uh, altogether as such then, right? So that's all bad, that's all, you know, so we are dealing with this. So then what do we do about this? Or what do the guidelines say? How should we uh, be looking at this uh, from a clinician standpoint or in our clinic as such, right? 
So this is Diabetes Canada guideline recommendations. Uh, first of all, um, they say that we should be trying to identify or screen for these uh, problems. So we should regularly screen for diabetes related uh, distress, which we said is very, very common. Uh, so this should include uh, diabetes distress, psychological insulin resistance, as well as fear of hypoglycemia, but also for psychiatric disorders, including depression, and then suicidal ideation should be, uh, should be asked uh, as well. So that's the first thing is to identify, to recognize, or to screen for these problems. And this was a second question that you, you guys had, and you 100% of you uh, got it correct, right? Uh, so diabetes distress, the scale that is recommended by the you know, Diabetes Canada guidelines is the diabetes uh, distress score, which has uh, 17 items you can read, and I'm sure you're familiar with those items. And then major depressive uh, disorder uh, for depression, the PHQ-9 is what is recommended, uh, and, uh, and some of the symptoms uh, that, that are mentioned on there. The other scales that could be used are here uh, on, again, from Diabetes Canada guidelines. So diabetes specific uh, scales could be used uh, for, for distress, like uh, paid scale, the problem areas in diabetes scale. There's also a quality of life scale that may be used, uh, the WHO5. And then there's the depression, anxiety, the back depression inventory, be, inventory being one of them as well. So again, most of the time, uh, maybe screening tools. There's also the PHQ-2, uh, which is like two questions rather than nine. Again, some screening and then going on to further, uh, you know, uh, investigating. If you find that screening was positive, you need to investigate more and see if there is uh, either de uh, depression or distress in, in that person with, uh, with diabetes as such, right? So that's uh, about how to screen for that and what to do about it. I think uh, is more interdisciplinary, and it may actually uh, need to be individualized, of course, right? Not every patient with diabetes, probably we don't have the resources as well, uh, can undergo a psychiatric in, uh, you know, investigation or, or assessment. Uh, not everyone with diabetes probably can get to a psychotherapy or cognitive behavior therapy as well. So what we need to do as clinicians Whatever we do, whether we are endocrinologists, family doctors, whether we are diabetes educators, whether we are pharmacists, you know, incorporate some of that in our, uh, in our uh, assessment and interviewing technique is some of that motivational uh, you know, kind of encouragement that we need uh, uh, for, for these patients as such. So at LMC, LMC is a group of uh, community endocrinologists. Uh, we have about uh, seven uh, LMC centers across uh, the GTA. Uh, that's what we try to do is team care approach. Uh, we don't have a cognitive behavior therapy uh, approach as such, but uh, then again, peer support and diabetes education, and then, uh, and then endocrinologists uh, together uh, try to get uh, people uh, to understand and perceive, uh, hopefully uh, motivate them to do better in their life as well. This is a study that we published uh, two years ago. Uh, where we looked at how people were being referred and what their A1Cs was before they were referred. So as you can see uh, that, uh, you know, the first 10 years I, I said about the glycemic uh, legacy, the bad glycemic legacy, that's the effect that we see. You know, they've been jumping around, around the eight, eight and a half percent. Most of them never saw diabetes education. Uh, only one fourth of them uh, saw that. Whereas when they're referred, they get diabetes education, they also improve their A1C and hopefully improve uh, you know, some of their quality of life or, or uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, their, their thoughts uh, and, the, and their uh, processing of their thoughts as well. Uh, this uh, further look at uh, people who attended diabetes education when they were referred versus not. So what this is showing is glycemic efficacy. We did not in this, uh, in this uh, study collect any kind of psychological assessment, but that would be something uh, you know uh, to to think about whether that is uh, also impacting and how much of that impact uh, impacts uh, this A1C control. Of course, the end goal is to do better and reduce complications. But I think peer support and diabetes education is key in everybody, and team approach uh, should be uh, should be one of the things uh, that should should be uh, you know provided to every patient uh, who gets diagnosed. Now there's another, uh, you know, uh, another kind of study that we did. This was kind of the resistant patients, if you will, but those are not uh, the resistant depression patients. These are patients who are resistant for their A1C. 
Many of them actually may have depression comorbid, uh, as a comorbid condition in addition to having a resistant H1C, which is staying at 9% or higher, and this is despite uh, endocrinology care, this is despite the team care that we talked about in the previous study. So what do we do, do for those patients? Those are maybe about 20, 25% in, in any of our practices. Those are the people who need more social support and they need to uh, you know, uh, basically uh, deconstruct uh, their life and, and, and be looked at or encouraged uh, to deconstruct their life and then try to strategize as to how to, how to do better um, balance uh, their, their diabetes and their health as well as their life uh, priorities as well. So what, that's, and that's kind of what we tried to do in this DROP A1C study. The intervention cohort got more of that, uh, the psychotherapy kind of approach. And then uh, the intervention uh, cohort, of course, did better in terms of their A1C is uh, what the orange bar is showing uh, rather than the green. So what does Diabetes Canada guidelines say in terms of uh, everybody, every patient who is diagnosed with diabetes, everyone should undergo some psychological, psychosocial interventions uh, in terms of their diabetes care. That should include motivational uh, interviewing, it should include stress management strategies, coping skills, family therapy, and case management. And again, every patient may not need all of this. It may be dependent on, on the individual, so individualize this, but try to at least uh, you know, look into this and, and see which patient had, has what kind of needs and then kind of individualize uh, diabetes. Now diabetes, the pathophysiology is different, it's heterogeneous, but also the environment that the people live in is so heterogeneous, so much uh, different that you, that you will never find one patient with diabetes um, being the same as the second patient that you see uh, next after that patient as well. So pay attention to the pathophysiology, but also their psychosocial environment and try to uh, you know, address uh, both of those uh, situations when we are, when we are managing uh, diabetes. And one of the techniques, uh, and I, uh, I won't say that I'm, I'm uh, you know, well versed with this, but I'm trying to incorporate more and more and more of this, which is motivational interviewing. And I would say this is something we need to uh, learn more from the psychiatrists and other um, you know, uh, psychological health uh, professionals uh, as well, which is motivational interviewing, which is uh, you know, it's guiding more than directing, and it's dancing rather than wrestling. So I think dancing rather than wrestling, it could be, I mean, okay, we don't want to do either with our patient. We don't want to dance with them. We don't want to wrestle with them either. But uh, it's, it's more about, uh, you know, I'm sure all of us have had this situation, uh, especially with a new uh, patient who comes in uh, to your clinic and we start wrestling, oh, uh, you know, you have this condition and they are looking at, us, at you with, uh, uh, with distrust and not, and not sure what you're, what you're trying to get at. But sometimes it just clicks, and it clicks at the end of that encounter. You find that, oh, now you're at the same level, and now you're uh, kind of dancing together, if you will, rather than wrestling. And that's what we should be trying to do uh, with, with every patient is find that balance and try to, you know, try to coordinate our movements uh, if, we, if we can, uh, try and encourage uh, that, uh, that patient and try to see where they're at and maybe try to bring them one step ahead from where they're at uh, rather than saying, oh, you are here and you need to be here. Why are you not here? The other things, uh, again, uh, a lot of uh, you know, uh, acronyms or, or words in there, but then ACE is something that uh, maybe should be uh, you know, incorporated into diabetes management. That is autonomy versus authority. Uh, yes, we know what is right for you, but are you ready to do that? And, and it's your, you know, it's your uh, uh, prerogative to, uh, to actually do that or not. And it's, it's totally up to you. You want to go on insulin? No? What are your reasons? What are you thinking? What are your fears? You know, that's, that's where we need to uh, uh, delve into when we talk about uh, motivational interviewing. Uh, so that's just an example of that. So this is how Diabetes Canada envisions uh, that every patient with diabetes uh, should be treated. Okay, pharmacotherapy is one thing, diabetes education is one thing, but having a team environment, so you in the middle is that patient with diabetes, and then around that patient is people, healthcare providers, who are kind of talking and, and encouraging and listening as well. Uh, around that patient and giving them the right encouragement for the right time, whatever that time is for them. 
uh, is what uh, diabetes kind of envisions. And among that, among some of the specialists, mental health professional uh, is needed for certain patients. And what do the Diabetes Canada guidelines say about referral for mental health uh, professional uh, with people with diabetes? They say these are the people who we think should be referred to, uh, to a psychiatry assessment and, and management. These are people with uh, significant uh, distress, which is related to their diabetes. These are people uh, who have uh, persistent fear of hypoglycemia or this fear of insulin needle, et cetera. Try to get at that, and, and if you, it's, been, it's been persistent, you've not been able to overcome it, you know that uh, you know, this person should be on insulin because their A1C has been 11 for the last five years, despite whatever you've been doing, there's something wrong, right? So this person should be referred to a psychiatrist or psychiatric uh, assessment is what the uh, guidelines are saying. Or of course, if they have any psychotic uh, disorders, uh, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, et cetera, are some of the other reasons uh, for that. And uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, uh, but treatment options that are, uh, that are recommended in the Diabetes Canada guidelines, uh, broadly CBT, other types of psychotherapy, and then antidepressant medication. And I actually learned a lot uh, when Roger went through all of those uh, antidepressant medications and uh, the exciting uh, evolving field uh, as well. Uh, so it was very instructional uh, to me. Now this collaborative care uh, approach uh, has actually, is actually evidence-based as well, right? So it's not just people talk and then, uh, you know, you, we don't know if it works or not. Uh, so this is uh, one of the studies that looked at collaborative care intervention. This was a family practice uh, kind of a setting and it was physician supervised nurses who were doing, uh, you know, psychotherapy in people and these people had both depression and diabetes as well as what, uh, what these people had. So what they looked at is 12 month and 24 month changes on the depression score. So if you look at the blue at the top, blue is uh, you know, um, further reduction uh, versus the red, which is no intervention. So that's true for depression score, A1C, LDL, systolic blood pressure as well. And some of this at the bottom was actually sustained in the extension phase of the study which was up to 24 months uh, as well. There's also been on the same uh, idea, there's been a meta-analysis looking at whether this collaborative care, kind of a depression, uh, diabetes collaborative care model uh, works, works on, on uh, depression score and works on A1C. And you can see at the bottom that the meta-analysis suggested that it actually helps depression, depression score as well as the A1C as well. And, and that's, uh, you know, so in that way, uh, there is some evidence at least uh, in an, and in a an, uh, meta-analysis, uh, which was published a few years ago as well, that suggests that those people who have depression and diabetes do actually get better in terms of the depression and diabetes and, and achieve better glycemic control if we try to collaborate and, and use an interdisciplinary approach uh, as such. Now, of course, uh, there are uh, many, many unknowns and there are many, many uh, things that we need to research uh, as such. Uh, some of the research uh, needs to be done as to which diabetes therapy affects the mood in what way, and we have no idea. We are actually just scratching the surface when we, uh, in terms of research that is out there, and we don't uh, know too much uh, details about this. Uh, not just pharmacotherapy, but also exercise, for example, or diet modifications, how does that impact, uh, you know, uh, any of the well-being or distress or, or depression kind of a scale as such uh, should be looked at. This was a pilot study a few years ago, uh, 50 patients, uh, type 2 diabetes and depression, 12-week intervention of uh, just exercise and CBT sessions. It actually improved the uh, severity of depression as well. So again, uh, we need to do more of this research and maybe on a larger scale and, and see how we can scale this more uh, as well in our population, especially if we are talking about this epidemic overall that is engulfing us. Clinical weight management, uh, of course, uh, if we talk about weight management, it, it cannot be one fix uh, that fixes everything. We talked about the epidemic, 50, 60% of Canadians may have overweight or, or obesity problem. How do we fix that? Of course, public health approach, uh, you know, the built environment approach, uh, maybe sugar tax, et cetera. But then we are, when we are talking about individual patients, these are some of the things that we need to look at, which, are, uh, which include cognitive behavior therapy, mindfulness, of course, nutrition, physical activity, 
maybe some people who are at a significantly higher BMI to be considered for a gastric bypass surgery or pharmacotherapy as such as well. Now, in the past few years, uh, we've had some, uh, you know, positive or, or uh, available therapies in terms of pharmacotherapy when we come to treating obesity. But again, how does this impact uh, long-term weight, long-term quality of life, long-term maybe depression, long-term maybe diabetes uh, is unknown at this point. And then we need to keep researching all of this uh, at this point. But these are the three Health Canada approved drugs that are there. Uh, Orlistat, uh, which is basically a gastrointestinal lipase inhibitor. Uh, we, you know, we have it, but we don't use it as such uh, because of the fecal urgency and incontinence and flatus that uh, that is uh, kind of a side effect. Riraglutide, uh, riraglutide is a type two diabetes drug that is approved uh, as uh, by the trade name of Sexenda uh, for obesity management, even in people without diabetes as well. Um, we have a good uh, track record of this in type 2 diabetes. We have good studies of this in obesity without uh, type 2 diabetes as well. So this is another therapy that is available to us. Uh, but again, how does this impact long-term outcomes or depression or distress is, uh, is uh, pretty much unknown at this point. And then we also have uh, recently, more recently, this uh, Contrave, which is naltrexone and bupropion uh, together combined in one pill. Uh, many of you are uh, probably more familiar with bupropion than, than me uh, as an endocrinologist uh, because we've used it uh, for depression, as was mentioned by Roger. But then again, uh, you know, this is a, uh, a different kind of combination and a different uh, approach. Uh, and this is indicated for obesity reduction. Now, uh, how does it impact, uh, you know, long-term uh, kind of uh, uh, mood? Probably in a positive way is what we would think. Uh, and how does it impact uh, this cross-pollination of obesity, depression, diabetes? Uh, we need to look at it uh, further as well. By the way, the three um, uh, pillars of, uh, of eating that I talked about, the palm C and the ghrelin, and then uh, you know, the hedonic, the pleasure kind of uh, uh, the brain uh, situation, and then uh, executive functioning, uh, you know, uh, some of these medications actually impact that, right? So Sexenda impacts the GLP-1, uh, the uh, contrave impacts the POMC neurons, and in the middle, it also impacts the dopamine and the, and the opioid uh, receptors uh, as well. And uh, so again, this is just uh, you know, a small study uh, that is looking at liraglutide and its impact on brain function or amyloid deposition. We need more such studies is what we need. Uh, we don't have uh, much evidence in, into uh, inflammation, into brain um, physiology, pathophysiology, and then amyloid deposition as a, as a cognitive uh, you know, function uh, change over time is what we need to look at. So I'll just finish. Um, I realize I'm pretty much out of time, uh, but uh, I'll just finish and summarize. Uh, first of all, uh, I think we, uh, we are closer together, uh, me and Roger physically, but also in general, I think uh, the two fields are coming together uh, in terms of looking at it from a holistic standpoint, I, and I believe that's, that's the way forward uh, to benefit our patients. Psychosocial intervention and team approach should be for every patient with diabetes. We should be screening every person with, uh, with at least the diabetes distress scale and a PHQ-2 or PHQ-9 in addition to that. Uh, so screen your patients uh, and also then, then decide on an individualized basis what does this patient need, not just in terms of what's their next medicine that they need, but also what is the, what is the interdisciplinary team approach or, or what kind of therapy, what kind of psychotherapy, what kind of other interventions in terms of their uh, you know, uh, uh, psychosocial construct uh, that may help uh, them achieve the goals that they want to achieve as well as we want to achieve together is, uh, is how we should think about it. Uh, so thank you.